So um, we have two immune systems. Most people don't realize that. We have two immune systems. We have our primitive or innate immune system, and we have our specific or targeted immune system. Now, nobody really talks much about the primitive or innate immune system now because we know so much about the specific one that the primitive one seems uninteresting. But um, it, it's actually quite interesting because your primitive immune system probably uh, is playing a role in the creation of cancer in a pretty substantive way. So the primitive immune system is the kind of immune system that attacks things blindly and broadly and quickly before it really knows what the invader is. Um, so an example would be if uh, a lot of different, if a huge number of people were coming at you and you knew within that group of people, one of those people was going to kill you, um, but they were coming fast and you had no idea who was going to kill you, you'd pick up a machine gun and you'd just levy the whole crowd because you'd know if I levy the whole crowd, I'm going to get the one who's going to kill me, right? That's a nonspecific immune response. And your body has just that kind of an immune response. It has a group of enzymes and inflammatory things that it does. When there's an evader, it immediately goes into inflammation and shoves you off. Now, all of you actually have experienced uh, your innate immune system or the innate immune system of an animal, maybe without even knowing it, because our innate immune system is the same, has, is encoded by largely the same genes as all of our predecessor forms of life, all the way back to the Drosophila fruit fly. We can find the same genes for primitive immune system in, in the fruit fly as we find in man. And um, an example of an animal who has an innate immune system that you may have experienced is a jellyfish. When you're walking along the beach, if you would step on a jellyfish, and it would slap you and suddenly you have pain and redness and swelling. That's because it has injected enzymes into your skin that are dissolving the skin. Your foot doesn't belong in the middle of the jellyfish. It's a foreign invader. And so the jellyfish has attacked you with its innate immune system. The significance of that is that we have that in us. And so when something attacks us um, or triggers it, we go into an inflammatory mode. Now, why is that important? Because years of in inflammation is what leads, in many cases, to chronic diseases. It can lead to diabetes, heart disease, and it can lead to cancer. Years of infl inflammation can lead to cancer. And things like obesity, being overweight, that triggers inflammation. Um, there are things you can do to, to, to fight inflammation. You can lose weight, you can get more sleep, you can exercise. Exercise reduces inflammation. But all of these kinds of things are things that are important perhaps in the prevention of cancer. And so we have conversations as doctors with our patients all the time who say, I'm going to use diet and I'm going to use all these other things. Well, diet and, and weight reduction, body, low body fat, all those things are probably important in the causation of cancer. There's not much evidence that they're important in the treatment of cancer. It's our specific immune system that becomes important in the treatment of cancer, and that's what we're going to talk about right now. If we have any slides. Uh, there we go, okay. So um, I, I'm actually not mic'd up. I didn't realize we didn't have a level of mic. So can I, is this uh, wireless? Can I take this with me? So if you look at this slide, the hallmarks of cancer pathogenesis, this is from a very seminal article that identified what are all the elements in creating cancer. So you can see up at the top here, evading growth suppressors, so uh, finding a me mechanism of escaping the things that suppress growth of cells. Oops. Um, activating invasion and metastasis, enabling repli replicative immortality, meaning allowing it to keep dividing and dividing in an immortal way, inducing angiogenesis, uh, new blood supply, resisting cell death, sustaining proliferative signaling, deregulating cellular energetics, and avoiding immune destruction. So you can see that there are many different factors that go into a tumor being, f being formed in our bodies. I really don't, there we go, okay. So what evidence is there that if you have a reduced immunity, that, that the immune system, what evidence is there that the immune system and cancer have a relationship, as I've just said? Well, here's a chart showing um, the increased incidence of cancer in immuno, immunocompromised individuals. So these are people who developed malignant tumors 
when their immune system was suppressed after a transplant, when you're on immunologically suppressive drugs. And you can see up here, non-melanoma skin cancer leads the list. There's a 20-fold increase in non-melanoma skin cancers in people who have an organ transplant versus people who don't. Non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, Kaposi's sarcomas, kidney cancer, right there's melanoma. Eight-fold increase in melanoma in people who have had a, a, an organ transplant and immunosuppressed from the general public. So that's very strong evidence that shows the, the dance between the immune system uh, and cancer development. Additionally, if we look at tumors, and th these are some um, data on ovarian cancers, people with ovarian cancer being treated. Um, and you can look at, um, and this graph here, or this slide here shows T cells that are infiltrating the tumor cells. Okay, so these are immune cells, T cells that are infl infiltrating the tumor versus those people when you biopsy them that have no T cells infiltrating the tumor. The T cells are simply restricted to the surrounding tissue. They're not in the tumor. And you can see a dramatic difference in the overall survival um, this isn't really projecting very well, but you can see the overall survival is 50 months for those where the T cells are able to infiltrate the tumor cells, and um, the overall survival is 18 months for those people where the T cells are not able to penetrate the tumor. So it's another piece of evidence that the immune system is very important in killing um, cancer cells. So th there's a dynamic between cancer and the immune system here, and this dynamic system can either suppress tumor growth, development and survival, or can allow tumors to overgrow. There's this balance between the immune protection and immune evasion. Immune evasion is a very important concept. Most of you have seen Star Trek. Uh, you remember when, um, when they wanted the, the enterprise to be able to move around in space without being noticed, they would click on a kind of a a shield on the outside, right? And the Klingons couldn't penetrate the, the shield. Well, tumors have the same ability to put up a shield like that, and it, um, it covers up all of the evidence that this spaceship cancer is around. And so your immune system can't see it. And a big part of, of harnessing the immune system is to overcome this immune evasion um, and break it down. So there's three, um, three phases of this dynamic process. You can either achieve elimination, where the immune system eliminates the tumor. You can have equilibrium, where the tumor persists, um, but it doesn't grow because it's controlled by the immune system. Or you can have escape, where the immune system fails to control the tumor and the tumor growth proceeds. And some of you who have um, melanoma may have experienced all of those things at different times in your course. There may, may have been times when the tumors seem to grow out of control. There have been times when they are present but not growing, but they're also not gone, and other times when they're shrinking and gone away. And that's, that's what's happening. So let's look at elimination. This is what we would like to see, um, where the immune system eradicates cancer cells. The immune system is effectively identifying and destroying cancer cells. Um, it's a natural process, and so the immune cells recognize it, they come, they destroy the cancer, and then normal tissue is able to persist. When we have equilibrium, we have the situation where the, the immune cells are, are there, they're controlling the cancer. You can see they're surrounding it, they're controlling it from growing, but it's not gone, and, and then surrounding that are normal cells. And then finally there's escape, and that's of course where the tumor cells begin to grow, the immune system tries to attack it, it isn't able to stop it, and the cancer cells keep growing, and we get progression. So what are the key components of the immune response? You've probably heard all of these words but not known them. One are antigens, which are molecules that are produced by either um, uh, microbes like bacteria, other foreign agents, and sometimes cancer cells that bind to T cells and antibodies. There are cells that you'll see in a minute called antigen presenting cells that are important in get taking those antigens and presenting them to the immune system so the immune system can make a response. There are T cells and these are activated by, um, by uh, antigen presenting cells so that these T cells become the warriors that are specifically searching out the enemy and then B cells produce antibodies that help mark the, uh, the cancer cells and let, let the uh, rest of the immune system know where the cancer cells are. There are five features that you need to have an effective immune response. You need it to be specific, so it needs a target of spe specific antigen or marker for the tumor. 
there needs to be homing or trafficking, which is the cells need to be able to get to the tumor and kill it. It needs to induce cell death. It needs to be adaptable, which means it can expand, and this is a concept called antigen spreading, which I'll tell you about. And it needs to be durable, meaning that it needs to generate memory so it can keep killing the cells whenever it sees them again. Let's take a look at what the natural immune um, response looks like in its key steps. So the first thing is that this antigen, a marker of the tumor is identified, and an antigen presenting cell sees it and activates, gets activated. So now that one with all the spines coming off of it is an activated antigen presenting cell, has fragments of the antigen on the surface of it, which it's now going to present to the, um, to the uh, warrior cells, right? So now we have T cells that are ready to become warriors. When the antigen um, presenting cell presents the antigens, these T cells become activated. Now they're activated warriors ready to be able to find a tumor, whereas before they couldn't because they hadn't been activated and primed. Now once you have those activated cells, two things have to happen. One is that they need to expand so that you don't just have one warrior, but you have a whole army of warriors that know how to identify that. These are called effector cells. And then the second thing that has to happen is you have to have a small reserve of those cells called memory cells so that after this war is fought, if we ever see that antigen again, we can now induce another war and attack it again. We don't have to start the process over. Once that happens, the effector cells um, activate other immune cells and they kill the, um, the cancer cells so that it dies. And you can see those little dots floating out around it. Those are other antigens that are released from the cell. And that's this concept of antigen spreading I told you about, because once these cell dies and these antigens are released, it comes all the way back over here and it starts the process over again with a different antigen. And that's an important concept that we've recognized more recently, and that may be in part why immunological responses happen much later to tumors than, than chemotherapy responses. With chemotherapy, if you give a drug, the tumor shrinks within a few weeks. With immunotherapy, if you, if you give an injection, sometimes the tumor won't shrink for four months, m much later. And that may be because it requires this uh, antigen spreading concept to really intensify the immune response. And then finally, the memory cells um, uh, persist. And so if we ever see that tumor again, they can start the process of cell death. So um, how do we then take that normal immune system and harness it into immunotherapy? Well, the, and the National Cancer Institute has defined immunotherapy as a treatment to boost or restore the ability of the immune system to fight cancer, infections, or other diseases. So immunotherapy is meant to push down on that, on that balance system in favor of immune protection and really try to ha have our bodies kill that cancer. And, um, Immunotherapy is now an established treatment strategy. As I told you, this, this didn't exist 30 years ago. Today, there are immunotherapy agents that are approved to target um, over 10 cancer types. And we really start this at the bottom because this is where it began. The very first component of immunotherapy to get approved were cytokines. These are drugs like interferon and IL-2. These are very nonspecific, and that's the key. These are nonspecific molecules, interferon and IL-2. They, create a generalized immune response in the body, but they're not targeting specifically uh, a specific cancer cell. The real er era of specific immunotherapy began right here in 1997 with the introduction of the first monoclonal antibody to be used in man for the treatment of cancer. I had the, my, my relationship with immunotherapy uh, was fortunate to begin right there in 1997 when I was part of the research team um, getting um, Rituxan approved. And now Rituxan is still used all over the world for the treatment of non-Hodgkin's lymphomas and leukemias. And then the next one to be approved was Herceptin for breast cancer that was developed here in Los Angeles. Um, and um, many, many, uh, many, many other antibodies since that time, Herbitux and others. Next, in 2010, was the introduction, after many, many attempts to create a vaccine that would kill cancer, um, and all of them failed, failed very ceremoniously. Um, the, uh, there finally was the approval of the first therapeutic vaccine in 2010, and that vaccine is Provenge, uh, and that's a vaccine to treat prostate cancer. Um, and that still remains the only uh, approved cancer vaccine, and it's a very exciting and important um, platform for further discovery. Then what became the 
the discovery of the checkpoint inhibitors. And that was, um, we were very uh, happy and fortunate at the Angeles Clinic to be uh, major participants in the discovery of those with the first agent to get approved being the CTLA-4 molecule, uh, ipilimumab. And, and therein we began to see some of the most interesting aspects of, of immunotherapy uh, that patients didn't respond right away, but it took quite a bit of time. And that's when we began to understand there's a whole different type of therapy and all different kinds of side effects from things we've seen before. This is also the category that when a, a, a PD-1 molecule is finally approved, this is the category that they will be in as well. So you can see that there's a huge development of uh, of an exciting new field that's changed the landscape completely, and that's what you're going to be hearing about during a large part of today. But I want to end by saying that, the, that immunotherapy is unique and it's different, and we have to think about it. For example, with the uh, Provenge vaccine for prostate cancer, we can prolong survival in people with stage 4 prostate cancer, but the PSA doesn't go down. Why is that? We don't really know. It makes people nervous. But, but you live longer, but the PSA doesn't respond. It's a different kind of metric system of measuring response. And, 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 and I, I think you know, this is very well illustrated in this slide where you see that this is a patient with melanoma. This was the initial tumor bur burden on day one or day zero when she, before she began map. Here you can see on day 84, the disease burden has increased. So, Imagine doing those clinical trials, and here we're 84 days into it, and, and all we're seeing is tumor growth. Should we be abandoning this? Is this a failure? Then by day 112, you can see that the tumor burden has declined, and then all the way over at the end, you can see on day 503, the tumors have resolved. Now, if we were thinking about that in classic terms of a small molecule or a regular chemotherapy development, we would have really thought that um, this was a failing therapy. But because the immune system works in a different way and a different timetable, um, we, we've, we've seen that, that it's a whole different class and it is able to be integrated with all the other therapies quite effectively. So, um, the thing that's exciting about this is that it sets for us a um, kind of a vast new future, and I think that the future of immunotherapy is quite bright, and you're going to see some of the brightest investigators from around the country here today who are going to talk to you about the clinical trials that are going on and the future of each of those categories of immunotherapy, as well as some of the targeted therapies and some of the newer um, surgical uh, approaches to melanoma, and, 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 and probably the most important key of all of this is that to treat melanoma, it does take a village. It takes an integrated team of people, surgeons and medical oncologists, and in some cases radiation oncologists, um, dermatologists, everybody working together. Um, and when we do that, a piece by piece by piece, we now have a situation where even people who have had metastases to the brain can get complete responses and live often decades um, and decades. So uh, it's a very exciting time, and we're happy to share this, this meeting with you today. And I'd like to um, uh, uh, say thank you very much for joining us and invite Dr. Hamid to come up.